Um, I'm going to answer the last question, actually, because I do know a little bit about it. I, I debated um, Lawrence Solomon a, number, uh, a couple of years ago. And he's one of those people who says that um, temperature is warming on other planets. And it is true that if you look selectively at other planets, um, the temperature is warming. You have to be very selective. Um, the thing is that what's happening with other planets is that it has a lot to do with where they are in their orbit. And that's why they're warming. And we know exactly why that's happening. Um, and that's not what's happening on Earth. Um, so it's, it's kind of something that deniers uh, point out, um, which is kind of deceptive. Um, uh, so I'm going to cover some of the areas that uh, uh, we didn't talk about. <laughs> uh, climate change is a pretty depressing topic. Um, in 2008, thereabouts, there was a study that came out that showed how many people are dying from climate change today. And that was in 2008, and they said the figures were growing. And that, at that time, there were 315,000 deaths, excess deaths, that they figured were from climate change because they were from climate-related impacts that were growing around the world. Um, so we're already getting some of the effects that we're going to be feeling in the future um, in a big way. Um, also, there was an estimate of refugees coming up. Uh, in 2050, we're expecting to have anywhere between half a million and 500 million refugees in the world um, from areas that are uh, affected by drought, affected by rising seas, that kind of thing. The scariest thing that really kind of makes me feel the urgency of having to deal with this and dealing with this rapidly was uh, a study done by the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and that was released in 2009 in advance of the Copenhagen um, meeting of, of, the, of, the, of the United Nations. And what they suggested was that by the end of this century, 2100, if we continue and don't and fail to address climate change, we'll have a world that's anywhere between five to seven degrees warmer than it is today, and the carrying capacity of the world, that is the number of people that the world will be able to support, will fall to one billion. We are seven billion now. We are still expected to rise to nine billion by about mid-century. If we do nothing, almost 90% of humanity will not have a place to go. And more than die, because if we don't have the resources to put them exactly where they want to be, uh, where they need to be, more will be affected. So we're talking about, you know, sort of worldwide holocaust where we kill off nearly everybody. And just a fraction of humanity is left, and that's what we're inflicting on our children if we don't act fast. Um, in uh, 2010, I was in Cancun for the climate change negotiations, and one of the things that became very clear to me uh, was just how dire the situation has become. Up until that point, I had been advocating for, you know, let's do this fast because we can avoid some of the worst impacts. We are at the point, as James Hansen says, that we are facing real consequences now. There are people profoundly affected now, um, and no matter what we do, we have some fairly miserable options going forward because uh, we've waited too long. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't act, uh, because the consequences will get a lot worse if we don't. Um, but what happened in Cancun was that the United Nations uh, Environment Program, UNAT, put forward uh, something called the Emissions Gap Report. And this was an extremely important thing. The problem with the United Nations and the way they meet is that the only scientific uh, information that they're willing to accept is that it's compiled by the entire United Nations, their uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, their reports. Um, uh, sorry, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their reports. Those reports come out very infrequently, and they're always put together from data that was collected before, so they have time to analyze it, it takes time to print, and of course that was collected even before that. So quite often when the IPCC reports come out, they're already dated. Uh, and then it takes years and years and years until the next one comes out. So the last one was put out in 2007, and there was a tremendous, sorry, yeah, in 2007, there's a tremendous amount of data that's come out. That very year, it was interesting that the, the IPCC report anticipated that by um, the end of this century, 
we might get a loss somewhere towards the end of the century of 30 percent of the of the um, uh, of the uh, Arctic ice. And as Lee pointed out, that very year that that report came out, we lost almost half the ice in in the Arctic based on on previous years in one year. So you can see how. Uh, it's really important to update that science. So the United Nations uh, Environment Program stepping in was really important because that was something that United Nations negotiators will actually pay attention to because it is a United Nations agency. Um, so they were going back on what people had uh, committed to in Copenhagen the year before in 2009. What was agreed to in Copenhagen was in addition to the long-term commitment that all nations have pretty much to prevent catastrophic climate change, to prevent dangerous climate change, they actually put a number on it for the first time. And that was one of the few good things that came out of Copenhagen. There's a lot of bad things that came out of Copenhagen, but one of the few good things was that they put a number. In fact, they put two numbers. They put the number two degrees, that they would avoid two degrees at all costs. They also said that they would consider 1.5 degrees. And the reason they would consider 1.5 degrees was that there was a study commissioned by um, the AOSIS nations, those are the Alliance of Small Island States, because th those little islands started realizing that if the Arctic keeps going the way it has, if Greenland goes, as Lee pointed out, they're going to be underwater. They will not have a country. So it was very critical to them to figure out at what point are they threatened. And so the study that came back that they commissioned indicated that they needed climate to remain under 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels if they were to survive as nations. So in, in Copenhagen in 2009, the agreement was that they would review the science and by 2015 decide and they might adopt a target of 1.5 degrees. So when UNEP stepped in the year later, they were talking about the reason why they put together this report was to show that the commitments made by countries to theoretically prevent a two degree rise were so hopelessly inadequate for preventing a two degree rise. In fact, the trajectory that they were going on was hardly different from, do from doing nothing at all. Countries are very reluctant to commit to anything. We need much more stringent ways of pushing countries to do the right thing. But what was interesting about this report is that it did talk about what would be needed uh, to prevent uh, uh, a rise of 2 degrees or to prevent a rise of 1.5 degrees. And as best as they could tell, all of the trajectories that would, that would get us to 450 parts per million essentially require us to eliminate all use of carbon by around mid-century. So we have very little time. We, can, we have to really stop burning. And as the, um, Lee pointed out, the IEA said, We've, we will have burned through that space in the next four or five years just if we continue building power plants, coal-fired power plants globally at the rate that we're going. Because if those plants then live through their life expectancy, then we will have killed the planet. Um, to meet the 350 degree uh, sorry, to meet the 350 parts per million record. I don't know if you want to understand this. This is the, the number of uh, carbon atoms or, or carbon equivalent uh, warming gases in the atmosphere that there are. So the pre-industrial levels were under 300. We are now at 390. So to meet 350, we would actually have to suck carbon out of the atmosphere, which is not an easy task. The way that we would do that, uh, the, the UNEP report did identify ways of doing this. They were all theoretical. They weren't. They hadn't been modeled in the same way as the others because none of the IPCC models actually reached 350. All of those required very, very deep negative emissions. What that means is not just planting forests, but planting purpose-grown forests, burning that carbon and sequestering it underground. That is reversing the process and trying to stick carbon back into the ground. That's something that's you know really unexplored. It's not really clear that that would work. Um, there's all kinds of problems with leakage. There's questions about whether it would work. But the biggest problem with this is that 
What it would require is converting huge amounts of the Earth's forest cover and the areas where many of our, of our uh, native peoples on, on the globe live, converting that to purpose-grown areas where they're doing service to try to, to, to manage climate. So what we're doing very much now, when we choose between those two targets of 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, and that's roughly 450 parts per million versus 350 parts per million, we're choosing whether we're going to support the small island states and their ability to stay above the ground, uh, sorry, above the waves, or whether we're choosing the native peoples and their rights to live in their forests and manage their resources as they have in the past. There is actually a way that we wouldn't have to sacrifice either, and that's a different kind of hell. Uh, $350 did identify a way that we could get to 350 parts per million, stabilized climate at 350 parts per million, without doing any of that kind of negative, uh, negative carbon uh, sequestration. And the way that you would do that uh, is by eliminating all fossil fuels basically from the globe this decade. We've got about 10 years, and we've got to figure out how to stop burning everything. Um, so if that introduces yet another kind of hell. Not only does it mean that we would have to endure a significant uh, reduction in our style of life, most developing countries would never accept this because what it means is that they have no developing development rights at all. They are stuck in mired in poverty for eternity if that happens. The reason why I might still consider promoting that kind of thing, and I do actually, I, I mean I'm involved with all kinds of people who are advocating for the most rapid emissions possible. The reason that I would do that is because there's something else going on which is not quite climate change but it's very closely related, and that is the acidification of the oceans. That is another huge threat that is only now being understood, and it could be far more dangerous to us even than climate change. So keep in mind that climate change will kill, uh, you know, 90% of humanity if we, if we let it go unchecked. And keep in mind what that looks like. These are not people who are going to just, you know, not be born. They are, you know, we're talking about groaning humanity, a massive pulse of desperate people on the move from countries where they can no longer feed themselves, desert-stricken areas. Um, uh, if Right now, the Earth's ability to grow food has actually grown from pre-industrial times because of the carbon in, in, the, in the atmosphere. It actually somewhat enriches the ability of plants to grow. And there is an expectation, this is in the IPCC report, that that will continue until temperatures are about 1.5 degrees higher than they were in pre-industrial times. At that point, they will start growing, going down very quickly by around 2 degrees uh, the ability of the Earth to support agriculture will be the same as pre-industrial levels and it will continue going down below that. So after two degrees, we're rapidly, very rapidly shrinking our ability to grow food. Lots of parts of the world will start to go into desert as more and more water is sucked up and swirling around in the atmosphere and again contributing to global warming as well. So we have a lot of things to balance. None of the options are really great, but what we can do is to say the faster, the faster that we can get ourselves off fossil fuels, the better our options are going to be. The more we, we can avoid facing some of these very, very, very ugly choices in the future. Um, so we need very, very bold moves. We need our leaders to take charge. We need them to do <coughs> remarkable things. We need them to embrace things that actually exist, and the only thing that's standing in the way is, you know, political lobby groups, status quo, people who want things just the same, oil industry lobbyists, and other people. Um, I want to point out to you something that I just learned in the last year uh, from the filmmaker who made uh, who killed the electric car when I went to his uh, gala opening of his, uh, his updated movie. Electric cars use less electricity than gas cars. 
Is that an amazing fact? It's true. Um, it turns out that the, that the electricity required to refine the gasoline in one gallon of gas would take an electric car further than it would take an internal combustion engine on one gallon of gasoline. So if all of the cars in North America suddenly went electric today, the, the demand on the electricity grid would actually drop. Um, in Europe, there's hundreds of thousands of homes um, that are being built now, and not just homes, all kinds of structures that are built to a standard where they have no mechanical heating system at all. They don't burn anything. They are heated passively by the sun, and they are so well insulated that they don't require any mechanical heating system. And they are pleasant to live in, they are light filled, they don't have that mechanical hum of a motor, they don't have that recycled air, they have more air changes per hour, they're quite delightful, and they're built more economically than our conventional homes because it costs more to put in a furnace or a boiler and all of the ductwork than, than it costs to add some insulation and do it right. That standard has, is debate, has been debated in Europe for a long time about how we can, uh, uh, about when they will adopt it as a standard, as a universal building standard in Europe. We don't have anything like that here. Our uh, building uh, standards are archaic. They're ridiculously, absurdly inadequate. If we need to get off fossil fuels quickly, we need to stop building crap. We, uh, we need to eliminate coal across uh, across Canada in a decade, and you know, kudos to our provincial government for eliminating coal. That was a, that was a bold move, um, but we need to do that across Canada, and that means that we have to put in a lot of effort into building the infrastructure for non-emitting sources, particularly renewable resource, uh, renewable sources across, uh, across the country, because they're the only things that can manage to do that in a decade. Anybody who says nuclear, I, you know, I challenge you to build a nuclear power plant reliably in a decade, it's not going to happen. Um, and we need industrial changes. Our industries need to decarbonize very, very quickly. Now all of this, if we do all that, it comes at a cost. And that does mean that, you know, very likely, if we're, if we're eliminating the energy sources that are so dense and have been so helpful, each one of us wanders around the world every day uh, with, with what are essentially a thousand energy slaves. For each bit of energy that we put into the economy, there are a thousand units of energy released from fossil fuels that do work for us. So if we give up that, it is very likely that we will not have quite as much stuff. Uh, but, and certainly, you know, when you look at uh, uh, the World Resources Institute and their estimates that people in developed countries are using per person the resources that if it were across the world, we would need seven Earths to support our lifestyles. We are probably going to have to trim things down. But of course, there are pros. If we do this, we will have cleaner air we will have fresher water. Our kids will be able to swim in our rivers. Uh, we'll, be, we'll have uh, a re reduced cancer rates. Our foods will be healthier. We'll have all kinds of, of reductions in, in the toxins and stuff like that. So there's big, big benefits to doing this. The last thing that I wanted to point out is the importance of prices. Uh, and this is, you know, you talk to anybody in this field and Lee pointed it out, other people here have pointed it out, uh, you need to get a good, strong price mechanism that reflects the actual damage that fossil fuels cause. And this goes even beyond climate change. Uh, coal kills. Coal, uh, the coal, uh, Ontario's coal plants, and this isn't all the coal pollution that we feel, just the coal plants from Ontario cause over a thousand deaths to Ontarians every year. Um, if you put a price on that and said, you know what, you're going to have to pay for, it's not just the deaths, it's the asthma treatments, it's the lost work time, and all of that, coal would be priced much higher than it is. In every country where they've succeeded 
in bringing down uh, either energy or emissions. It has always been in the context of high prices. There's a very huge correlation between the price you pay and the energy, and, and a negative correlation between the price you pay and the energy you use. If you pay a lot, you're going to use less. And I do want to say that those prices are protective. When you look at what happens when uh, you have spikes in prices, like we had in 2008, when the price of oil went up to $150 a barrel. In every case, the people who were hurt most were in those jurisdictions where they didn't have high energy prices. The United States, which has among the lowest gas taxes in the world, was hit the hardest. Drivers in Germany, where they, where they pay five to six times as much for energy, felt the 20% price increase. It's no big deal. They survived that, and it wasn't, it wasn't something that affected them. But they've adapted to those high energy prices by making sure that they have excellent public transit system, that their cars are small, that they have excellent commuting opportunities, sorry, excellent carpooling opportunities and that kind of thing, and that they live in a range where they don't drive so much. So all of that contributes to being protected from what are going to be the shocks as, we, as, our, as our fossil fuels come to an end. And in that context, I do want to stress that we in Ontario are facing something right now, uh, which is we've got a budget, um, and the opposition parties are threatening to take down that government, our provincial government, and to um, have an election. And uh, the NDP, one of the things they want is, uh, is a tax on the ultra-rich, which I'm not going to argue against. I mean, I think we can have a tax on the ultra-rich. I'm fine with that. I don't really care if you are or not. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, but one of the things they want to, want, want to use this money for, and this has been something that the NDP has done systematically in every election, they want to take the HST off home heating. They keep wanting to subsidize fossil fuels. I can't tell you how stupid, how regressive, and how perverse that is. And I think if any of you are interested in climate change, the one thing that you have to demand is that you are going to be angry any time anybody tells you that they're going to keep your fuel prices cheap. Because that is, that is, that is the way to kill any opportunity of progress. Because no matter what you do, you know, you can build the most excellent public transit system. Nobody's going to use it if you subsidize the gas for their car. Nobody's going, if you want to retrofit your house, if your fuel prices are high, the payback to do, to do retrofits can be three years instead of ten. Those things are really important if you want progress. So you want to have a fair price that reflects the scarcity of these fuels, the fact that they do cause damage, and the fact that we need to wean ourselves off them or we'll never do it. What we're going to go through is shock after shock after shock. And it's really, really cruddy also to suggest to people who are living in energy, in energy poverty that somehow taking off the uh, uh, 7 or 8 percent of their fuel prices is going to make a big difference to them when fuel prices have gone up and down by 300 percent based on fuel scarcity, ups and downs. This is not right. This is not something that we should entertain. What we need to demand is higher energy prices. Um, and I do want to stress, who's going to benefit from this? Who's going to benefit most from taking the HST of home, uh, of home heating? It isn't going to be the people living in energy poverty. The single mom living in subsidized housing in a, in a, in a rented uh, apartment where she doesn't pay the heating bill at all gets no benefit. The big beneficiaries are going to be big, rich people living in palatial, uh, leaky houses with uh, a lot of bells and whistles like heated pools. <coughs> So I can talk about what kind of pricing structures I favor. I'm mostly in favor of what Lee, uh, Lee suggested. Um, but I think that's something that you all need to watch for. And particularly in the context of this election coming up, I really would like um, for you to keep that in mind. 
Um, and I guess on the last word, as we move forward, and we please do demand these bold initiatives because we really, really need them. Um, one of the things that you can do, uh, Lee mentioned it, join the Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, they're a group that actually teaches you to go out um, and talk to politicians at every level of government and make the kinds of demands for what we need. Thanks. Okay, now we'll take questions for Adriana, and while people are waiting to line up here at the microphone, I'll ask the uh, first question for Adriana. Uh, so, Adriana, you mentioned um, you mentioned about how we've gone up to 390, and we need to get down to 350, and the whole idea of actually sucking carbon out of the atmosphere seems like a daunting task. Maybe we can plant some trees. Um, in looking at Al Gore's uh, climate graphs or carbon graphs, I looked. I was quite surprised to see that one of the big carbon spikes was around 1870, 1875, 1880 area. Maybe you know what happened during that time? Uh, the plowing of the Great Plains. The plowing of the Great Plains was a big spike in carbon because uh, breaking up the soil released a whole lot of carbon into the atmosphere. Now, if we could reverse that process, instead of pumping carbon into the ground, which is possible, I suppose, but uh, we could perhaps just get it to be deposited in stable soil deposits. Uh, and that can be done by restoring forests, restoring natural vegetation in various areas. I'll leave you to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically every, every trajectory, even to 450, but certainly to 350, involves basically replanting much of the forests that have been lost in the world. There are also some, um, I, were you uh, hinting, alluding to um, biochar? No, I'm not familiar. I know I've been involved with a number of sort of bio re re risk restoration projects of various types, but I'm not hitting anything in particular. Here. That that's an interesting idea, and I, you know I'm, I haven't fully embraced it because there's people who are very worried about um, its implications if if implemented on a grand scale. And again, the threat is to are you know if we do it on a grand scale, are we affecting uh, native populations and their land rights? Uh, but biochar is interesting stuff. Um, it's in theory, you could, you could um, pyrolyze, which is this process of half-burning uh, uh, agricultural waste, and basically making it back into coal. You're making charcoal. And then you can stick it back into the ground, and it fertilizes the soil and lasts for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so yeah, the, the problem is that advocates of it say, oh yeah, this is great, it's fully sustainable, and then they talk about burning, you know, forests and forests and forests everywhere towards this end. So, you know, it's kind of scary what it could do, but but it also has some potential if, if done right. As a final remark, I've heard of large amounts of sugar cane waste that are burned every year, so perhaps we could start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. done from waste, mm -hmm. I'm all for it. Gal, yeah, next question. Um, I love what you're talking about, the difference in housing sizes between North America and well, other parts of the world. Um, in any of the, I guess, discussions you've heard or movements that you've seen, um, what, I mean, it's one thing to, I guess, retrofit a house. Uh, is the only way to convince people to go smaller by raising energy prices, basically? Probably. <laughs> Uh, people like big. <clears throat> um, just David Suzuki pointed out that just in the last few decades, our houses have doubled in size, and our families have halved. We have so we have four times as much space as we used to um, just a few decades ago. Uh, I'm I'm going to be attending um, a, a conference on degrowth, and that's something that scares people a lot. Uh, the idea that we could talk about, you know an economy that's not actually growing, but it might actually be shrinking. Um, it doesn't scare me. I think, I think what we need is something that's sustainable and something that gives us, we need to really start looking um, at things that improve our lives. And things that improve our lives are not necessarily bigger spaces. I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see countries run on a principle where what we focus on are things like um, better education, higher higher uh, infant survivals, higher life expectancy, better literacy rates, uh, um, better health outcomes, 
uh, you know, reductions in asthma rates and stuff like that. And critically, one of the things I'd really love to see is to have, have us have more time with our kids. You know, instead of chasing after getting more and more stuff, if we can reduce some of that, use some of the efficiency that we've gained in, in uh, our industrial processes and say, you know, we have enough stuff. Why don't we just spend some time with our friends? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I'd invite you to comment on the following. Many issues can be framed in, in, in uh, different ways. And what I see is many pundits on the carbon question focusing on carbon itself and how humans are using carbon. Um, they look beyond that at a deeper level. It, it seems to me it's about uh, corporate power, the profit motive, and a dysfunctional political system that are the root causes. I'd like you to comment a little bit about that. Can we perhaps consider, as, as any pundits on the issue, uh, reframing the question so that we talk about what's happening in the future in terms of uh, climate genocide and the potential that what's happening, especially with the subsidies accelerating climate genocide towards the fossil fuel industries being framed as, oh, say, criminal negligence causing death. <laughs> yeah. I, I would invite you to um, look up Holly, Charlie, do you remember her name? Polly Higgins. Polly Higgins, that's it. Polly Higgins is a, is a UK lawyer and she is actually looking at making um, equal side, a fifth crime against humanity, um, equal to genocide and other, and other uh, UN crimes. So that people who do this, you know, people like Harper <laughs> could be brought to justice, hauled into court, and, and you know, so to so, so. Um There was something else I wanted to say about that. Um, so yeah, Eva said, look up Polly Higgins, and I would really urge you to support her. Uh, there was something else that you said that I thought we could touch on. It may come to me. Sorry, I'll take the next question and I'll try to remember. Well, I'm interested to know if you have a list of countries that are considered to be the biggest polluter on the And the reason I ask that question is because we are here in Oracle. Yeah. Canada is not even a member of it right now. This is considered by many countries. It's like a joke. Okay, because carbon taxes. Okay, we in Canada here can do a lot to shut down coal plants, shut down nuclear plants, all these things. But there are other countries in the world that do not agree with us, and they're going to pollute the fly over here. So in order to solve the problem, you got to have all countries on earth that join in that. Some do, some don't. United States don't do it. China don't do it. Sure. That, right? I'll answer that. Um, okay. There, there's actually a couple of things um, swirling around that whole question. First of all, you know, the idea of which countries are the biggest polluters should not be the question. Let me make that very clear. Because if that's the question, if we're going to punish countries because they have a lot of carbon emissions, then all the countries will have to do is say, oh, okay, great, we'll split up. You know, China can split up into 10 countries and suddenly they have way less emissions than we do. Yay! That's, you know, that's not, that's not the problem. The problem is how much pollution is there per person and on that score, Canada comes out really, really, really bad. You know, we're actually the eighth biggest polluter in the world, but in terms of per capita, per person, there's only a few tiny little oil states that are higher than us and the United States. That's it. That's it. And the United States emissions per person are falling, whereas ours are eh, not so much. They fell a little bit in 2009, and that had nothing to do with efforts on our part. I, I, it, okay. it, it had, hang on. It had to do with the fact that we were in an economic recession and oil prices had risen so high that our economy started shedding uh, the oil intensive uh, infrastructure. In terms of what we need to do to get the rest of the world on board, please keep in mind, first of all, 
Sure, Canada has now said we are still part of Kyoto, by the way. We will be till the end of this year. Uh, we had to give a one-year notice of our intention of withdrawing. So we will be out of Kyoto at the end of, in December of 2012, if Harper has his way. And we can not still stop that with a lot of pressure. The, the thing is that Kyoto is just one tool within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And keep in mind, Canada is still part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We are still signatories to the Copenhagen Accord that says that we will commit to 2 degrees, and if the scientists say so, we will commit to 1.5 degrees as an upper limit to what we do. So we don't get off scot-free. The Kyoto Protocol was based on other protocols that worked, the Montreal Protocol for, uh, for um, uh, CFCs, it's ozone. Uh, ozone depletion. And the idea, and it's a very fundamental idea, makes perfect sense. The countries that were responsible for most of the CFCs in the atmosphere were the big developed countries, the industrial polluters. They put most of that up, they, and they were also rich and wealthy and had the best ability to figure out how to stop doing that. So they should go first, and then the developing countries would use the technologies that they had developed in order to follow suit. That's the way the Montreal Protocol worked. It worked beautifully, so the thinking was that that's what we should do with greenhouse gases as well. Now, greenhouse gases are a lot trickier. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is, like I said, we all have a thousand energy slaves behind us, so it's not quite the same as changing your refrigerant, which actually proved to be pretty easy. When you're trying to figure out how to eliminate the lifeblood of your economy, it's rather more challenging. The other thing is that um, with CFCs, we're talking about refrigerants. So, you know, a refrigerator made in the United States, well, the Chinese made their own refrigerators. And uh, so, so the U.S. continued to make their own refrigerators to their own standards. The problem with greenhouse gases is that when you cut down greenhouse gas emissions, even if you were to cut greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, there is a worry that you will offshore and just build all that stuff in China and ship it back here, and that means that you get, it's produced in a country that's where it's produced with even more emissions, plus you get the emissions from the transport, so you're no further off. So we do need to have all countries on board, absolutely. And that's something I agree to, and most scientists and most climatologists and most international negotiators understand it too. However, Canada is in an extremely poor position to demand anything. We promised that we would decrease our emissions by 6%. 6% is not a lot from 1990 levels. And keep in mind, Europe has met their emissions reduction uh, quota, uh, Australia has met it, Japan is close. We're the only country where we're like, instead of going 6% below, we're more than 20% above. And we're saying, China, you're so bad. You have to reduce your emissions. It's crazy. They're not going to listen to us. We sound like idiots. If we can't do it, on what grounds are we going to tell people who have you know, less than half of our emissions per person that they have to smarten up? We can't do that. If we want to have a global deal, we have to do our part. We should be leaders. I agree with you, we all should do our part. Uh, we all should do our part. But as you wanted, wanted, I just want to make one, uh, one comment to one of your statements that yeah, we should shut down our co planning because more countries they want to build more and more and more. So yeah. the reality sometimes it just, I don't just see, just don't see how it works. Well, I mean, do you, are you willing to just say, you know, well, the 90% of, of our grandchildren will die? Is that okay with you? No, it's not okay. Then you can't give up. What you can't just accept that. What you're suggesting is, is still a hope for my own. No, <laughs> I'm not, I am not suggesting a lot of I think we do need to bring China on board, but I can tell you that China, I do think. Yeah, China, the United States, everybody needs to be on board. But I do want to point out that China is listening a lot more to the um, EU. The EU walked into the last negotiations in, in Durban, South Africa, and they pointed out that 
Given the current trajectories where European emissions are actually dropping, unlike us here in Canada, and Chinese emissions are actually rising, by around 2020, Chinese emissions per person and European emissions per person will be approximately equal. So they are in a position to say to China, hey, by 2020, you can't count yourself as a developing country anymore. You will be a developed country. And that's something that China can actually listen to. And if we were in that position, we could actually argue with that. But instead, we're arguing that, oh, we're special. We've got to do this. We have to have concessions for here and here. We're not doing anything. And we're telling them that they should do something. We, you know, if we want to get other countries on board, we have to lead the way. We're a rich country. and climate change, etc. But I put a challenge to you and I'd like to comment on that. And to all, all the activists, there's a real disconnect here. I mean, we, we say go out and, and outreach the people, you know, get their hearts and their minds, and then we, 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 we bash Harper, we bash who, we bash what. Um, excuse me, but um, I think the disconnect for a lot of people is they, they see the outdoors, they see the giant areas, they see all these people living in these you know, big homes doing big travel on their big private planes, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, my challenge to all of you, or, or maybe I'm missing something, is why do you think a lot of people don't believe this when we don't hold those people accountable, when we don't hold the media accountable who are holding these people accountable, right? So, you know, I mean, a lot of us don't have respect for, for politicians, for most politicians anyway. I mean, yourself, and I never said, the Honorable Rudy, really, you know, they're, they're decent people, they're people we talk to, but the only thing other politicians are listening for is simply one thing, are you voting for them or not? So most people, I, as far as I'm concerned, they, they see the, the movement uh, as, as basically, well, yeah, okay, I mean, if, if your own you know, iconic leaders are still flying around in the planes, owning 30,000 square foot homes, pools that equal the entire city block of, of energy, um, you know, help me here. Uh, yeah, I'd like to understand this, and I think that's one of our problems. We're not connecting with you know, the guy who's just got to go to work, you know, starving, not starving, you know, struggling to survive, the woman start, you know, st struggling to, to, to to do that, I just don't see it. So we absolutely do need to connect to, to common people. And one of the one of the frustrating things that we're facing is, you know, as we're as we're facing these economic struggles, and they're going to become worse. What we're what we're seeing is a greater rift between the very rich and the very poor. Um, it's growing and growing and growing, and and not just the very poor, the very rich and the rest of us. Uh, so, you know, what we're going to end up with if we continue on this trajectory is something like uh, the, the medieval period where there's, you know, lords and vassals, uh, which is n not pleasant. Uh, in terms of uh, demonizing politicians, though, I, I really should say, uh, you know, I think I'm being pretty fair. I don't think I'm an overly partisan person. The government that we have right now is toxic. There's just, you know, uh, federally, the government that we have... Um, I, I, does, does Al Gore actually have a private plane at this stage? I don't, I've never heard that. Yes, yes. yes. So I, I, Al Gore, I know, travels, uh, travels in... So what? I, I do want to stress, Al Gore, when he's traveled, and he's traveled to do this work, this has been his job since he lost the presidential election. This is what he does. Yeah, but isn't he going to make a lot of money for carbon credits? Uh, you know, uh, can you yeah. join us in that? You know, we'd love to have that conversation. Yeah, no, I'd love to have that conversation. And, and, and actually, that's that's the one thing that I think I disagree with Al Gore on. I think carbon offsets are bogus. Okay, and as the, uh, but, as the just kind of... But, it, no, hang on. I, I do want to just say, he's been demonized uh, tremendously. His life has been ripped apart and picked apart in a way that none of us would appreciate, looking at everything he does. And the reason for it has nothing to do with his wealth. There are people much wealthier than he is, like the Koch brothers, that nobody's picking apart into their, their lives. The reason he's been de demonized is that he's a threat to the oil industry. And let's face that. <laughs> the reason why everybody looks at him is because he is effective and he threatens the status quo. And the media... Do you think the Koch brothers are not the Okay, I do want to, first of all, I want to say that we are invited to come to the Baton Rouge afterwards, and this is the kind of discussion, and a number of people use the H word here, so I'd like each one of those people to put up their hands to indicate that we're going to the Baton Rouge
which afterwards we need to do a head count. Is that right, uh, Betty? Okay, so how many we got there? We got two, four, six, that's seven. That's only seven, eight, ten, twelve, okay? 12, 14, 15, okay, that's great. Uh, do you want to notify where we have to notify? This is the point of order as we go forward. You should mention there's beer in that yeah, There's beer in that number of chefs. Is that nice yeah. the problem? The soft drinks and food is beer. Does anybody change their mind if they knew what to put up their hand? Okay, so it's about 18, okay, good. Do you want to just notify them? That'd be great. Okay, I want to go back. Just as a point where we've got four minutes left, I'd like all these questions to get answered in the next four. Do you want to just do all three and I'll try to answer Real quick, okay, if you want to just go one after the other. Uh, I may have missed it, but we're slipping out of the room. You were talking about uh, putting a price on carbon and poor people having to spend their income on it. And I'm asking a question about uh, how does that affect poor people versus rich people and what you do with the revenues. Thank you. you know, what do you want to say? Um, the, the, the reality is that the amount of carbon we use is most closely related not to our greenness, but to our wealth. And that really explains El Gore. Anybody who makes a lot of money is going to have enormous emissions associated with them. It's, it's really, there's a really close correlation. If you're rich, you travel, you take extensive vacations elsewhere, you have big houses, you have swimming pools, you have bigger cars, you travel more. Um, that's the truth. If you put a price on carbon, most of that money is going to come from the very rich. The people who travel most are going to be paying the most of that carbon tax. Um, so the question is still, though, they can afford that, they can reduce that, they have the means to cut down their emissions very easily. It's actually the people at the lower end, even though they have tiny emissions, and the amount that they would pay more is not very much, it's still those people that you have to worry about because they're living in poverty and they can't afford any increase in the prices they pay. So that's where it's really important that when you set up a carbon price, you make sure that you take care of those lower income people. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very frustrated by a lot of cap and trade, pro, uh, uh, cap and trade uh, plans that are, even, even when they have uh, auctions, which so solves some of the problems with cap and trade, but even there, if you're using auctions and then you're using that money to fund programs of the government, even if they're green programs, it's a bad idea. And I'll tell you why. Because, if the government gives money and they say, okay, you know, we're going to use this money coming from a carbon tax and we're going to fund it so that people can buy more energy efficient cars and they can put solar panels on their roof, then you get to put a solar panel on their roof and you get to buy an energy efficient car. And the lady who's a single mom who lives in rented apartments and, and you know, really has a tiny tiny income, but her clothes are going up, her food are go is going up, and she gets nothing because she's effectively subsidizing somebody else's solar, <coughs> solar panel. That's not right. We absolutely need to give that back. Just to let you know, the Green Party's official policy is uh, a fee and dividend. So we tax, and then we take that money, all of it, we don't keep a penny of it, it goes into a fund, it's not in general revenues and it is distributed to every adult. So what ends up happening is every one of you would get over $1,000 a year to offset. And more than 80% of, of Canadians would be expected to benefit. So you would actually see more money in your pocket. Though I would caution that that money is there so to help you reduce your carbon emissions, because if you don't, you won't. Yeah, you'll be worse off. But yeah, that's what you, you'll, you'll benefit. You will do better. And poor people will do best of all. Yeah, just, just quickly, you mentioned Al Gore, and Michael Mann's been threatened. He's the man who came up with the hockey graph. Um, just what you're on about just now was really good. With respect, you, you took stuff when you're looking at the greater good as opposed to the political good. Um, and we need to start, all as Canadians, we need to really start looking at what's the greater good, not what is good for me, not what is good for my family, but what is good for all of us. Um, and we really need to start stop being selfish. Yeah. Across the board, all of us, I heard two ladies walk out. And AGM said something just now, and I thought, this is bloody stupid. They should be selfish. Anyway, just very quickly, Harper is the elephant on the world. He doesn't care, the West doesn't care if there's a war out east because oil goes up in price, tar sands, 
Now, oil sands and tar sands makes more money. So we have to look at that. And a quick question for you, which is very quick, we ask quickly, which is a real problem, and we're not, if this is a symptom of the overall problem in this country, they want to put islands at the bottom of the Humber River to stop the pollution going on Sunnyside Beach. They don't want to go up the river and stop the pollution coming down, which is a problem across this whole damn country. So, with respect to your point, you're the first person I've heard in public saying half got 25%. It's actually 26.25%. But basically, there's 75% of this country don't want Harper or didn't vote for it. So, if you're really realistic, this is a dictatorship. Thank you. If you know that.